Thank you all for coming, everybody. Uh, does everybody know who uh, Monterey Institute is? Not profit? Who doesn't know? Perfect. Uh, does everybody know about the National Repository of Online Course Project? Right. A little bit? Yeah. The, the NROC project has um, been around for about seven or eight years now, and the intention is to bring together high quality, multimedia based course content for high school and especially high school and, and uh, community college students to make it available as an open resource. Uh, this project was going on a while, and um, it, uh, it came to a point where we needed more content. You know how these things are, you continue to have content. We've been getting content from sources outside uh, academic institutions from around the country for a number of years. Ultimately, it became time to build content ourselves to sort of fill the holes. What we chose to build first um, is uh, math. And probably, no surprise to anybody, math is a, is a major issue in the United States. <coughs> About half the students in the US entering uh, higher education have to take some kind of developmental course, not infrequently, it's developmental math. About half the students in the U.S. on average don't pass Algebra 1 in 8th grade or 7th grade when they take it the first time. So it's a major issue. Uh, it made a lot of sense to go there. The other reason it made sense was that uh, NROC, the National Repository Project, has a membership organization that kind of manages everything for us. They guide where we go. It's academic institutions from around the country that are, that are members. And uh, here's a listing of those. It's so small you can't possibly read it. But I can tell you that it includes about 28 or so of the state DOEs or their virtual schools, a lot of the larger school districts in the US, and um, uh, a, no a number of uh, the community college systems, state community college systems. As a group, they told us it's developmental math. That's the number one need they have. That's the number one hole in the library. That's what you should build. And so we listened to them, and we did. We got funding from both the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and one for Hewlett Foundation to build uh, first Algebra 1 aimed at first time algebra takers, which in the US is for the most part 15 and 16 year olds taking it in eighth grade, and then developmental math for everybody else, folks that didn't pass Algebra 1 and then have to repeat it, see it again, either in high school or not infrequently in college. The, uh, the objectives were, of course, to get students through these courses. Uh, our approach was uh, to really uh, uh, consider uh, multimedia as an approach to this, really look at it as a means of teaching. And we attacked this project like you attacked this project. We started with research. We saw what had gone before. We saw what products were out there, what research told us was working, what didn't seem to work. Additionally, we ran focus groups around the country. We asked groups of instructors, administrators, even students. What did they think? What did they want? What was working? What wasn't? And ultimately, those things uh, informed us about not only the engineering we use and the, and the fact that professional development for instructors had to be part of this. It had to be part of this to be successful. But the curriculum itself, since curriculum had to work with all 50 states in the nation, had to work and in alignment with community colleges and other higher education institutions that were using it, and the design itself. Now, one thing came out of this early on was the focus groups had some real serious ideas about what they wanted, and so ultimately it became an iterative process. The focus groups were actually influencing the product development, first design, then development, and it was iterative over a three-year period where we were running focus groups almost every month for the last three years to get we would uh, to get launched in what we built, but ultimately we're taking things off the assembly line as we built them, putting them in front of focus groups to make sure we got it right. And I will tell you, I've been building products like this for a long time, 20 or 30 years, and we got it wrong more than we got it right. And we all do, we thought we knew what we were doing, but when we actually put it in front of the users, we weren't getting it right, especially the students. Um, so the goals of the focus groups were the ones you'd expect them to be, to find out what people needed, what worked, what didn't. And for the students especially, students are, you know, they walk on campus kind of walking back in time. They're not using the same technologies on campus they're using other places, especially in K-12 institutions. They communicate in different ways. What do they really want? <coughs> We've been conducting focus groups now for over three years, a lot of them, with lots of students in lots of states and lots of instructors and administrators. In sum, what we've learned is as follows. Um, not surprisingly, what administrators and instructors told us was, especially in K-12 in the U.S., was that the existing digital products for math were too expensive. They cost a lot of money, not infrequently as much as $80 a student, sometimes a lot more, which is too much for most school districts, too much for most states. Um, they're inflexible. They're the curricula that they support wasn't easily changeable, so it didn't necessarily line up with their state framework. It didn't line up with what's going to be the common core for most states. 
And almost more, most importantly for a lot of them, it didn't work with their existing learning management system. They have them in almost every school district in this country, all the larger ones, have learning management <coughs> systems. All higher education institutions have them as well. So whatever you build, better fit in there if it's going to be useful for the way in which they do business now. And not infrequently, almost without exception, the existing products have their own proprietary systems. What we heard from students is even more interesting to me, having built stuff for a long time. Um, we're really aiming at students that were struggling. So not infrequently, these are students that have other things going on in their lives. And uh, what we heard from uh, most of the students, as, as the product rolled off, what we heard right away was, no, this is way too complicated. The language is way too complex. Make it simple. Uh, make it simple enough that I can hear it and understand it right away, especially for students for which English is a second language, major issue. Real world examples were a major issue too. You're gonna to teach somebody algebra. So if you're bringing together their understanding of, of uh, the written word with a quantitative spin on that word, now it's all gonna to come together. <clears throat> if it comes together in an example they recognize, like downloading music versus you know, how a bakery works, it, it, or how the trains work, or the number of trains, um, it, it made a lot more sense. So making it relevant and putting it in context was a major step forward for the students. Uh, and then the other was humor. Not infrequently, um, as producers of this, you may try to inject a little bit of levity here and there. Man, was that an uh, absolute disaster. Um, uh, I wrote the first scripts. I will tell you right now that a 60-year-old man cannot write scripts for a 50-year-old student. He just does not work. And uh, I thought that was absolutely hilarious, not so much. And so all those things add, added together, if you look at the products in the market now, um, a lot of those things are there. And it's part of the reason they're not working. It's part of the reason. So that all came together over the number of years. We, we brought it together as a white paper. So if you choose to and you'd like to learn more about these data, what we've learned, I invite you to go to, we have a website where this project is being tracked. It's called inrockmath.org. To go there and at the uh, project news section, you can download this white paper. It, it covers the data for the last, about the first two and a half years of the, of the focus groups. The last six months, we'll be updating it through time. Take a look. So all this informed us, and here's what we decided to build. And what here's what came out. We have six semesters of material. Uh, the first two semesters are algebra one, first and second semester. Then the next four semesters are death math. Uh, the, these are the typical. Course, <laughs> courses that are taught in the U.S. <coughs> primarily, and actually in Latin America as well. In saying that, they're not really courses. They are brought together as a collection that you recognize as something as a course. You know, this is algebra, I know what that means. But it's actually a collection of learning objects in all cases. So this six semesters is actually um, more like uh, 185 learning objects. What's the number there? 184? 184 learning objects. Um, and each of the learning objects, each of these chunks, which covers each of the chunks of content that make up these six semesters, has each of those multimedia elements in them, from uh, warm-up to video presentation to work examples, etc. At the same time, it can be organized by units, as typically happens, especially if it's going to be organized around a typical classroom in the U.S. There's about 29 units. At the unit level, which is more of a summative level, where now there are certain things you're expected to have learned in the topics, <coughs> You sort of apply these things. There's other multimedia approaches, including a virtual tutor, which ended up being a big deal for the students we're working with, uh, project-based learning, and even these, these simple puzzle games, which reinforce concepts and relationships, would end up being, although not important to most of the students using this, for the five or 10% of the students who were struggling the most mightily, this was the biggest piece for them. So we decided to leave it in. In total, believe it or not, you probably don't care about the U.S. math curriculum, but there's 516 explicit learning objectives in the U.S. math curriculum across the state frameworks, the Common Core. And so this embraces all of them at a grain size so you can actually mix and match this to fit all the states, Common Core, and all the alignments with all the community colleges in the U.S. <coughs> Looking at them side by side, the two selections of courses look like this. Um, Included with all this multimedia content is also a formative assessment system baked into this. So as the students go through, especially doing the warm-up, it is uh, appraising their performance, putting questions in front of them to understand what learning objectives they haven't reached yet, and then feeding that back system, that, uh, that data back into the system, and then changing the content they see based on, on that analysis. 
And those data are actually, we're building a new system, those are going to be passed back to the LMSs we're working with. So, what does it look like? Um, as I said, this is a typical landing page for one of the learning objectives, or one of the uh, learning objects. And you can see that there's all those, those six components I mentioned are available there, from a text-based warm-up to uh, video presentation. Now, the video is interesting. Uh, I, I made video for a living for a long time, a lot of television work. And, and I learned early on that video is really good at a couple of things. It's really good at concepts, and it's really good at examples. It's not so good at protocols, procedures, which is a lot of what math is. And so to pound away at process with video is tedious. And so um, we wrote these videos carefully around exemplars that would make the concept relevant to the students making sure the concept was up front. Why, why are we doing this? What is the concept here for each of these 184 learning objectives? The videos are short. They're YouTube length, like three to six minutes. They're highly produced. They have a presenter on screen, um, a lot of animation and graphics. Uh, they're quite beautiful, actually. And, the, and the, also, the other thing about these presenters, there was a trial. We went through probably 100 and 125 presenters, finding the one or two or three, actually we ended up with three, that really played well across the U.S. with the students we were serving. And, and I didn't see it coming, how bad that was. Um, <laughs> worked examples, each and every object, learning object, each and every of the, of the um, learning objects has two, three, four worked examples of work through the, through the material. So now if you're going through protocol, right? So it's typical whiteboard, voiceover. Who did we choose for that? Anybody know? Who would you choose? We chose Saul Khan, right? So uh, we went through a bunch of different presenters. They got shot down one after another with our student focus groups. <laughs> Saul is beloved by the student population in the United States. So Saul Khan did 800 worked examples for us. We wrote them. He performed them. So they're in line with the curriculum. They follow the curriculum exquisitely. Um, interactive problems, a review section, and even an online textbook. You can access it from each of the learning objects. It's an interactive textbook in the sense that it's sort of typically laid out for a computer screen, but it has interactive elements to it. You can also tend, you can you can dump it and print it if you choose. At the unit level, there is something called a virtual tutor. The intention of this, how many how many struggle with applying algebra concepts to unique problems like I did? Yeah, and and the thing is, you, know, you you understand the fundamentals of algebra, and then they give you some problem where you can't see where you don't plug in what where or a proof, any proof. And so the strategy of problem solving is something my teacher never taught me. The virtual tutor not only walks you through your protocols and procedures of a problem, but the strategies of that problem solving, because there's not infrequently multiple routes to solving the same problem. Right? You can do it more than one way. So the virtual tutor is all about that. And this ended up being a very powerful tool for not only students, but also for instructors. Instructors are using this in front of classrooms. Um, Project-based learning, so students can break down into groups as part of this. And finally, these puzzle games. <clears throat> really simple stuff. No rules, you line it up, you line it up and you're gonna know what to do with it. Um, and for the most part, it's all about reinforcing relationships, um, concepts, nothing more than that. And again, teachers are using this in front of classrooms. At this point, I was going to go out and show it to you, but we're not going to do that because uh, I don't think we're going to have time. So I invite you to take a look at this. Uh, it's at our, it, anybody know about Hippocampus, our uh, open site? Hippocampus.org is our open site for students and instructors, uh, any individual to use. Um, it's not at the old site. If you go to the old site, you won't find it. You'll see the old algebra course, but you'll see somewhere on Hippocampus, it'll say, go to the new site and go to the new site. It's a new site that's gonna be um, launched and, really, and and take over for the old site by the end of this year. It has uh, all this new material and it has other collections. It has Saul Khan's full collection, it has the FET full collection. Uh, it also has a um, uh, wonderful feature with you can actually build playlists. You can drag and drop all these pieces into your own playlist. It's very slick. Anyway, this new math algebra course is there. I invite you to go take a look at it. What I wanted to show you in the last remaining 10 minutes we have is the results that are starting to come in with this material. Because uh, why build it if it's not actually working? <clears throat> Algebra, first and second semester, was published uh, earlier this year in the spring. Dev Math, the first, arithmetic, the first semester, which is arithmetic, uh, we released the beta version in the summertime. 
right now we have 34 ongoing algebra pilots in the US and we have about 50 more queued up and actually I will tell you I probably have 150 more queued up they, they just keep coming in we have a ton of queued up for deaf math we have pilots queued up in 15 states we don't have the data in on this much yet we're just starting to get it I was talking to people in the hallway that are running this and sort of getting it anecdotally I by by the end of this year I'm going to publish a report on how this is doing but understand that, that we don't know how to use this material. We think we knew. We're putting it out of the hands of instructors and districts, and they're telling us. And about five or six use cases are rising to the surface as being good ways to use this material. That they seem to have positive results. Um, as I said, hippocampus is, is oh, sorry, algebra one is a hippocampus now. Take a look at it. We're going to have an interlock math app. We're going to start to publish this spring. So all this material, all this math material, and then later our history, physics, all that will be playable on any mobile device. And my smart TV, which I bought last weekend, and it's going to play on my smart TV, I'll tell you right now. So we're going to have these math apps uh, published uh, soon. And then there's a documentary film about one experience with this algebra program. As we were finishing this program, it was coming off the assembly line in sort of beta form, we had one district, one of our members, that was eager to get this. They've been really having trouble since Sierra Vista Alternative School in Whittier, California. So we were giving it to them as it was coming off, and they actually ran an experiment for us. A class using this material as a hybrid, and a class taught tradition. 20 kids in each class, 21 in one, 19 in the others. Just to give you a sense of what Sierra Vista is all about, it's an alternative school. It's kids that have struggled and had other problems, and they end up at the school. And the scores, uh, sort of the performance of the school is not very good. It's among the worst in the state of California, actually. And the, the red bars tell you that. You don't have to look at this too closely. The red bars are bad. It's, it's, you're, it's literally only a tiny fraction of the kids at school are even performing at competency in that. Background on who was in this, this experiment as juniors and seniors, um, more than half had credit deficiencies, that's why they were there. About 80% were teen parents, so they didn't have regular schedules, they were working. 20% uh, were homeless. All of them had repeated algebra twice before. Um, a lot of low income kids. We used, as we always do, the, whatever the benchmark is for the district or the state to find out how things are going. So we use the state benchmark for algebra. It's been modified slightly by the district, but it's the same benchmark. Traditional classroom, textbook, four times a week, instructor giving lectures, and then this product together on a, in a computer lab, <coughs> excuse me, with um, uh, a teacher coach that comes in three times a week for an hour or two to sort of lead them through. And here are the data. Uh, this is from the first state benchmark. This is a traditional class. The pass is at 60 percentile. And about half, 45 percent, got through it. And that's typical for this school. That's what they've been looking at tracking for the last several years. Here's a hybrid class. All but one got the pass. Yeah, we said the same thing. What? And so, um, it's working there, and I've since talked to them, and it's still working just like this. So it's working for them. Now, one thing's really important here. This obviously they're not taught the same way. This has nothing to do with our product. Our product just allowed this to happen, but they, the teachers do this. Um, the other thing is that these kids don't take the test until they're ready to take the test. That's a huge deal. So don't think that you know we're doing anything magical. Uh, but the point is that when they were ready to take it, this is what it looked like, and they're all ready to take it within the time frame that was the summer semester, so it actually works. Uh, here's the sort of overview results. And if you have any questions about this, I invite you to go to interlockmath.org. Oh, I have 10 minutes. Do I have 10 minutes? <laughs> oh, great. Um, I have two things. I, I have a seven minute video about this Sierra Vista um, experience. It's incredibly inspiring. It uh, makes me cry. And I'll show it to you. Um, but alternatively, or additionally, I can answer questions, too, for the next couple of minutes. So, any questions? Yes? I had a question about it. You said that the, the, were the kids that didn't have this program in the school, did they also get to take the test when they were ready? No. Okay. So they were paced. They had a normal, you know, and they show up, right, you show up, you take the test on Tuesday, right? Mm -hmm. And that has, I'm sure it has a lot to do with this. Mm -hmm. 
Um, uh, but they've actually tried it the other way, where the kids took it at their own leisure, and it didn't help. No. That didn't make any difference. Not with the kids. And it turns out that the kids in the hybrid course actually all took it on Tuesday anyway. They okay. just had a choice of when to take it. But the point is that the that the threat wasn't there. Right. Right. Would you just elaborate one more time on what the support was? In the classroom? Yeah, it was, um, I got to watch it actually. It's, it's, a, it's a computer lab. It was open uh, 12 hours a day so students could come and go if they choose to. And then three times a week, a teacher coach was there to help the kids for an hour or two. I, I could show you the video. You can hear her say it for herself. What made the three presenters that you chose successful? What's that? The three presenters that you chose? Oh. It was, I, I, you know, I'll tell you, it's really weird. What I heard back from the students, we had presenters that I thought sounded good and looked good, and the students would say something like, mm, they don't really believe it. And I'd go, what? And then I'd hear it from the same, I heard from students in different states. So there's something about body language or something subtle that I wasn't picking up, and our director wasn't picking up, but the students were picking up, and it just wasn't happening. Whereas the Persons you'll see when you look at the product, you're going to go. You're, you're going to think they're good, but it turns out they're more importantly they're believable and they, can, they engage with the 15 year olds that are watching. And how long did it take you to develop, to develop the algebra course? Two and a half years. So awesome. Long time. Well, because the first nine months were blown away by getting it wrong. <laughs> so I we That's threw away nine months of work before we actually kept it. <laughs> These guys, they, I'm, looking, I'm looking at the video online, but do like these video presenters, do they make all the animation or like at least tell you how to make it? Or the presenters? Uh -huh. Oh no, presenters are just presenters, they're actors. So they're just purely actors. Yeah, we, we went through teachers, went through, we ended up going with actors, and we had <coughs> scripters were professional script writers who happened to have masters in math. And then it all went through a vetting process with dozens of instructors that made sure it was right. So like you essentially broke up, you broke up the traditional like teachers, everything, the presenter, the curriculum designer. We, we tried it the, the way you'd expect and it didn't work and we just ultimately went back to professionals at every step along the way, including the curriculum. We had curriculum experts to make sure the curriculum was right. Every part of this was done by someone who knew what they were doing. You know, they were the best at their job. And not surprisingly, it worked out okay. The, the presenters that were successful, were they successful in the judgment of the students liking them, or was there attachment to performance of the students? I don't know. So it's quite possible that somebody who's really dry and boring might have been a better presenter. That if they're dry and boring, the students are. I mean, there's a matter. Well, I know. It's the engagement issue here. I mean, there's engagement. It's getting the math right, but it's also getting the students involved. I'm just that thinking in terms of the humor idea. Yeah. You know, off the top of your head, you think, yeah, humor is a great idea. It would be inspiring. I, I thought so. Liking the presenter may not be the successful route. I don't know. You know, I'm not sure it's like. It's mm -hmm. it's connecting. I mean, I, what I heard from students that would talk about it was more that the presenter reminded them of their uncle or their brother, and they were a good guy and they believed them. And the way they talked, they seemed to understand the neighborhood they came from. And the example they used was one that made sense to them. You know, it was it was that thing. It was it was not only the presenter's demeanor, um, and maybe probably partly their appearance and the way their inflection, but it was also the examples that they were using, which they didn't write. These are professional actors, but the writers were getting feedback from the focus groups on what was working. What, I mean, it, we we used a, a bakery example. I think for example, how much flour does it take to make cookies? No one cared about that. But when we talk about you know, skateboarding or uh, downloading music. Or, and so it was, it was a matter of connecting around things that matter, and then also culturally connecting with this case. What about the two demographics, the ages? Same presenters work for both? No. No, actually, they, they do in some cases, but not always. We, we had some of the connect, the presenters would work for the older demographic too, but not always. And so we had to start over. Do you want me to start this video? Two minutes? Yes. Two minutes? Actually, it's at the end of four, actually. Okay, we can be done. I can play the video and they can leave if they want. How's that? Yeah, that there, there, there. Oh, yeah. okay. There's, there's another thing in what, 15 minutes? Yeah. So if the video is playing, it won't hurt anybody? <coughs> so I choose to, if you like to leave, take off. If you want to see this. <laughs> I won't be upset.
services and alternative ed school. These are what we call at risk Hold students. <laughs> They've already had a situation. What happened? Did you extend your desktop? You're not going to see this video. It was already on my desktop. Yeah. But I mean, you said it. What did I do? You've got two screens connected. Check this place. Drag it over. Uh, i got to see it first. Gather the screens, it should be there, no? Okay. Okay, come do it yourself. <laughs> I think you got. So where is it? Yeah, where the video is. is an alternative ed school. These are what we call at-risk students. They've already had a situation in which they were not successful. We have a fair amount of teen parents. We have students who are behind in credits for medical reasons. We have students who are behind in credits for discipline reasons. We have kids who just couldn't focus in traditional classrooms. What we're really trying to do is provide an alternative here where they can be successful. We're trying different models, we're trying different methods of delivery, we're trying different types of curriculum. Algebra is one of the things that we have really been struggling with. We have tried several different delivery methods and none of them <coughs> were really what we were looking for. We knew we needed to change things somehow, but we weren't really sure of where, what direction to go. We didn't have a lot of resources as far as funding. So I looked for as many open educational resources as I could, and those are resources that are available freely, that are adaptable. One of the things I came across was Hippocampus, which is a project of the National Repository of Online Courses, NROC. This is the commercial part. <laughs> Algebra takes arithmetic and makes it stronger, faster. If you look across the country, the largest single cause of students not getting to a high school diploma is algebra. It stops them. If you don't get through algebra, you don't get through some of these base courses, you're relegated to a low-paying job or a fitting job at all these days. always see it, but you can find algebra just about anywhere. We developed a course that took advantage of a lot of the research that is out on how different types of technology address different types of learning styles. We have games that can help lower math anxiety. We have project-based learning that allows students to draw upon some higher level thinking skills. We had tried other online programs, but they were very rigid, and the students had to go through them kind of lockstep, and, and they would get caught up on one concept that they just couldn't push past. So we needed more flexibility. Our courses are built with a learning object architecture. So for example, if I'm an instructor, and I wanted to use that Algebra 1A course, but maybe I don't necessarily teach it in the same order that NROC has created it, the learning object architecture allows them to break it apart, move it around. They can add their own resources. We can add things, we can take things out, and we can make it work for our teachers and for our students. That's what really made the difference. We spend a lot of time talking to students, finding out 
what was and wasn't working for them. We would build something, take it off the assembly line, put it in front of the students again and find and say, how's that? And surprisingly, we were wrong a lot. Things that involved ranges of distances, like all the places you could go on a tank of gas. The language is actually critically important. It's got to be clear. It's got to be words that students hear and understand easily. Idioms aren't going to work because English may not be their first language. Humor doesn't work, especially for a 15-year-old eighth grader. It's just not going to work. It takes a lot of people who have different expertise teachers, teachers who've taught teachers, developmental editors, people who know how to write good problems. And this is the section of the textbook for the class. So this is where you're going to be doing all your reading. We're going to be looking at how to get those math tasks. When I'm in here with them, I'm working with them on anything they're struggling with. Sometimes we have to go back and redo assignments in order to get them up to par where they need to be. Really whatever they need to help them be successful. So I'm going to be there to help them on the way, but this is where you're going to need to go first. Students to go through the class at their own pace, it's been really important because the students that are really comfortable with the curriculum are able to work ahead and not be constrained by our timeline of getting everybody through at the same pace. Students who are struggling a bit more have that flexibility of taking more time. So they're under less pressure to complete things and it really just makes them more comfortable. So remember X then Y, X moves side to side, Y moves up and down. I know, I know you do. <laughs> I really like this program because it is so very different from the direct instruction classes. It's more exciting for me. I'm not doing the same thing every day, every week, over and over again.